you don't see very many people going around going, I'm so depressed. If you're really going to be depressed and if you're really going to get any joy out of being depressed, you have to take the posture that goes with being depressed. And you take that posture, of course it's coming from your nervous system. It's a neuromuscular response to threat, to guilt, to not wanting to sob, to not wanting to laugh. I don't know. I'm not trying to say what the depression came from. But boy, you don't see very many people who are depressed without this kind of being stuck on the exhale. This is what I call spatial medicine. If you come across somebody who's depressed, you could try to talk them, talk therapy, time-honored tradition in psychiatry, to talk them out of whatever it was in the past that got them into this depressive mode. That's one way to go about it. You could go about it from the material side. You could change the chemistry. You could have them take serotonin, or you could use food as medicine and have them eat fermented foods to increase the serotonin release from their gut. But whatever you're doing, when you do that, you're doing material medicine. You're trying to change the chemistry. And that works for some people. That takes them out of depression. But there's a spatial medicine part of depression. Nobody does this and gets so depressed. There are people that are like this. They're just as sick as the ones who are depressed. They're stuck on the inhale. They never exhale. Sure, they breathe, but they breathe at the inhale end of the spectrum. These people never really breathe out. The depressive people never really breathe in. Sure, they're breathing, but they're breathing at the exhale end of the spectrum. So you could go after it from a talk therapy point of view, which is trying to locate them in time, not to be stuck in the past or anxious about the future, but to be in the present moment. And that way all psychiatrists are, are Buddhists and Buddhist therapists in a sense. You can try to change the chemistry and that's the medicine that is on the ascendancy right now. Mostly we do it through drugs or surgery. We do all of this stuff through changing the chemistry so much so that that kind of medicine has pushed the other medicines to the side. But the third kind of medicine, which is really coming up now, it had its starts in yoga and martial arts. It had its real modern um, statement in Andrew Taylor Still of osteopathy. Ida Rolf and other people make even more modern statements of that. But what we're talking about now is how, what happens if you change the body's shape in space? Personal trainers are on the front line of that. Yoga people are on the front line of that. Pilates people are on the front line of that. And everybody's working separately. They're not working together in this realm of spatial medicine. And furthermore, if you go to the books, spatial medicine, it's not described that way. It's described as biomechanics. Biomechanics is described in terms of a muscle pulling across a joint via a tendon, which is limited by the ligaments in the joint, limited by the shape of the joint, and that's what the muscle is doing. But once you take in this idea of the fascia, that the fascia is a single, continuous network. It comes in in day 14 of your embryology, and it stays with you till you die. You can cut it with a scalpel. You can tear it if you have trauma. It will fray with age. That's what's making these lines around my eyes is the fascia in my face is breaking down as I get older. I can inject collagen in it and try and stop it. I can put Botox in it and try and stop it. I could have an operation and get it pulled back. But the fascia breaks down at a very regular level. In fact, the place that the fascia breaks down, the connective tissue, I should say, breaks down at the most regular level is in your eye. You have a container for the lens, and it has what's called vitreous humor in there, and that's a, a fluid, like a synovial fluid. And it, what makes those beautiful lines in your lover's eye, when you look deeply into their eye, is elastic bands that are coming down from the edge of that compartment to the lens. Now, the lens is made out of connective tissue, too. Here. Your, the lens that you have is presuming you have your original one that God or your mom gave you. Uh, and that lens is elastic and those lines that we see in each other's eyes, in the iris of the eyes, those white radial lines, are pulling on the lens and the lens can change its shape to adapt. Along about 48 years old, the fascia is slowly degrading and not replacing itself in that separate compartment. And for most of us, that lens gets less elastic at about age 48. And at about 40 age, 
age 48, your arms start getting too short because your focal length gets longer and you want to hold things out here to see them. And I'm speaking to the trainers now because in my experience, trainers think, oh, if only I do the right exercises and I eat the right things and I think the right thoughts, I'm going to live forever. I'm sorry, I'm here from this age to say not that I'm any great athlete or anything like that, but I'm afraid we're all going to die. We're all going to slowly get older, get more experienced, and have a kind of degeneration of the body, no matter how you're doing. Can we live to 120? Can we have those years be really good years? Yes, I think so. But will you forestall death? Well, I don't know. I don't think so. I think it's um, from the perspective of my color hair and my age, um, I would love to go back to my 20-year-old body, but not if I have to go back to being that stupid. <laughs> I've learned so much. I will take what has happened to my body in return for the wisdom that I've gotten.